Hey, what's going on guys? Matthew Weiss here, weiss-sound.com and Weiss Advice here on YouTube. In this video, I'm going to go over my tracking template that I use when I record Akon. I thought it'd be fun. You know, it's pretty simple. Uh, I don't think that there's really much to say except that the main purpose of my tracking setup is really not so much to get a sound. The sound can vary a lot when I'm recording Con because we record in all sorts of different circumstances, but the main thing and what I, what's really, really important is that the actual setup is just very easy to use. It's easy for me to navigate and it's easy for Con to do uh, what he needs to do because it's easy for me to navigate. So I'm just gonna go over the basic setup here. At the very top of Pro Tools, I have the instrumental track, or if there's track outs, then whatever happens to be provided for the track outs. In this case, I happen to have the bass and melody on one track, the drums on another track, and then I have an acapella vocal in addition from the original version of the song. And then underneath that, I have what I call a record track. A record track is something that I can keep always active in both record mode and in uh, input monitoring mode, which is, which is, which is this. This, this, this. Sorry about all the weirdness that might be coming off of that when I press that button. But basically when I have this track here, the reason I've got it is so that we can record a take and then when I move that take down to what I call a dump track, uh, we can play it back and Khan can hear himself if he starts you know, vamping or doing some kind of an ad lib thing or something like that. And also I can hear him. And so I can just immediately start recording if he happens to find something that he's, he's doing. So any kind of directives that he's giving me, I keep it on input monitoring. So we'll do the record on the record track. And then once we get a take that we like, I just drag it down onto one of these blue tracks here. The very first one is my lead track. And then I have a lead punch track, which are both used to sort of navigate between different takes for the leads. And then underneath that, I just have these stacks of of different things for harmonies and doubles, basically. I have a left channel and right channel, that's for doubles, and then I have S1 through S6, which are the harmony stack tracks, and sometimes I'll have to duplicate them just because we might be using a few more of them like we do in this particular record. And then underneath that, I have my sends, and I keep my effects very, very simple. I only have a verb, a delay, and a special effect, and the special effect stays muted when I'm doing the tracking, unless it's something that I absolutely know is going to be part of the song. In this particular case, I have a delay chained to a spring reverb, so it's just H delay, and then uh, a spring reverb at 50% mix. And so that's just a little effect that I can throw in from time to time if there's a moment that, that feels like it could require it. Sometimes I'll switch up what's here. Sometimes I'll have like a doubler of some sort on here. Sometimes I'll have like another quarter note kind of a throw. A throw. Uh, you know, it really just varies, but I default it to this delay in this spring just because I have something there and it's gonna be a go-to. The verb, I actually, because I have this set up for home, is my outboard reverb, my Bricasti, uh, but oftentimes when I'm tracking, I'll just use Waves R verb because it's simple, it's low CPU, it works. Again, it's not like I'm crafting the sound in particular. What's really important is that I'm just, I have a reverb there that I know sounds decent, and it's low CPU, so it's not gonna crash the computer while we're recording. Uh, and then for the delay, I have the H delay again. Same idea, it's not like the greatest delay in the world, but it works, it's effective, it's got a nice sound to it. And typically I'll start it with one of my presets called Weiss Quarter, which is basically what you're seeing now, but with higher feedback and with the low pass set to uh, closer to, well, here I can actually show you. Um, and I was gonna erase the setting. Um, yeah, what the heck, I'll just show you. There we go. So it's the high pass set over here at like 200 hertz. Then I have a low pass set at like 1.8K. So it takes out a lot of the top end. And then the feedback is not too high, not too low. And it's just a straight ahead delay, no ping pong. But here we're, we're doing something a little different. I modified it because it's a specific sound that we're going for. Uh, and then underneath that, I have our verb and I have just a little bit of reverb on the delay because a dry delay can sound good for sure, but I actually prefer very frequently to have a little bit of reverb on the delay. And so that, I guess, kind of crafts a sound in a way. Uh, this track right here is actually just the print of my Bricasti. I laid it back already, so I already have it in the record. 
Outside of that, there's really not that much going on. There's, uh, you know, I get tempo right at the beginning. In this case, the record's 124. I go to auto key and I get the, uh, the key of the record if I don't already know it. And then I set up auto tune. Typically for con, my defaults are this, whatever the key is. And then I use auto tune EFX for con still, just because again, low CPU, it has a sound. It's kind of like a slightly grainy sound, but in a good way. So I like it and con likes it. So we roll with it. Uh, I have him on the alto tenor voice. Technically, he is a baritone, but his range is so wide that he's anywhere from a bass to a tenor, depending on what we're doing, and I find that the alto tenor setting kind of grabs his voice a little bit nicer, I guess because it's a naturally brighter voice. And then the uh, retune speed, I default it to 12. That tends to work for Khan, but sometimes it'll go harder, sometimes it'll go a little bit less. It just really depends on exactly what we're doing and there's some variance within there. And when it's that fast, you know, maybe five milliseconds one way or another can actually make a pretty big difference. So the, uh, the only other thing worth noting here is that I keep my playback in loop mode, but I keep my record in punch mode because most of the time we're punching. Now, I do create playlists as we're recording on the record track. This is more of specifically an Akon thing, just in case I hear something that I like and I might want to go back to. So I will do some playlisting, but for the most part, we actually record destructively. So we'll get the take and you can see right in here that there's a lot of cuts between these lines. That's just taking the one that we like as it's performed, dragging it down, listening it back and saying, yep, that one's good, and then moving on. And so there's no playlists really here, uh, none on this track as you can see because we don't need it. And I prefer to keep the playlisting to a minimum. I know some artists really like to playlist everything. They like to go through a million takes and everything like that. But to me, I find that to be really counterproductive. I think that it works against the flow of just being creative and being confident with your choices and everything like that. And I really encourage people to stay away from doing excessive playlisting. If you do something that's cool that you might want to try or check out, that's fine. If you're also getting a map for the performance, it can be cool because then you can go through different styles of delivery and then you can create a comp and then you can go back over it and you can create a, a better take of that comp basically within that style if that makes sense but in general having like 20 playlists where you're just you're grabbing a syllable from every line is like you never get the song done there's no soul by the time it's finished you think you're grabbing the best of everything but in reality what you're just doing is making a very neutral performance in a lot of ways whereas i think that if you just go through and you just say yep that take works let's go with it and then you know if you're really not totally super secure with what you're doing then just do a backup take just do one just do one backup take and it's enough so basically all of this is set up in a way where it's very simple to streamline anything any artist can come over, look at what's happening on Pro Tools and say, okay, I understand what's going on here. This is very easy for me to see. I've got it. There's no complicated routing. If I need to send the session to another engineer for whatever reason, maybe somebody else is mixing the record, then you know they can open the session and they, they get basically exactly what the acapella would sound like. There's no fancy plugins. Everything is very clean and clear and there's nothing to have to undo. There's no bizarre complex routing where it's like if you try to get normal routing going, and I see this all the time, you you try to make a sense sensible routing where things aren't like clipped along the way and stuff like that, you end up undoing kind of what the rough sounds like. So the actual recording chain that I use for Khan is this microphone right here. It's a Jay-Z V67 going into my Avalon M5. The Avalon M5 is a good sound, but typically I do prefer him on like a BAE 1084, 1081, or 1073, or an actual Neve if there's one available and in good condition. Uh, I find that that adds a little bit of, of a nice body to like his low mid, which is always good to have, better to have it and not need it in that case, because that's where the, the strength of a voice comes from. So I do prefer that, but the Avalon is a really good substitute overall, and it is a great sounding preamp, so I'm not mad at it. And then it comes into a Lucas equalizer, which is like a three-band pull tech, where I'm taking out a little bit of 500 hertz, I'm taking out a little bit of 160, and I'm adding some 10K. So basically getting my my basic EQ formula going on on the way in. Uh, I find that typically this kind of a general setting will work in most places, but it certainly works here in my home studio. And then we go into an 1176, that's set four to one, attack and release are at 10 and a little bit faster than two. So it's not like 10 and two, which is the typical starting point. It's like 10 and almost three. And then the input is set 
fixed where I have it at a very specific spot because the 1176 like sounds particularly good when the input is just set to a very certain spot. I don't really know why or what the mechanics behind that is or even maybe it's just in my mind or whatever but that's where I keep it and then I adjust the output depending on how uh, how much room I have and how hard I want to hit the converters usually I like to leave a fair amount of space and then otherwise I just control the input through the gain on the Avalon so I'm gonna play a little bit by the way you're hearing my voice through that chain right now so now I'm going to play a little bit of what we recorded here uh, and I want to point out that you know if we look at where things are going, everything comes down to this vocal submix, and you can see that there's nothing on there, and then everything all together comes down to a submix, and there's nothing on there. So you know it, there's there's nothing nothing happening really here. This is just the straight track. There's auto tune on the vocal, and that's it. There's nothing special. The reverbs is really all that you're going to hear. So let's let's play a little bit of it. West Africa, uh -huh. North Africa, uh -huh. East Africa, uh -huh. Addis Ababa, uh -huh. have the same vision, Muslim and Christian. Right, so it sounds really, really good just right off the bat. You know, I'll play like a little bit of these first couple lines. Ishtakena, remix with Akon. Right, so that's that's a pretty darn solid vocal just to be tracked in that way. The only things that I'm really thinking I'm going to probably do to this vocal is maybe it's a little bit stretched in the top end and could use a little bit more firmness in the low mids, like around 400-ish to maybe about 800-ish, somewhere in there. So I'll probably do a little bit of EQing just to kind of contour things to be really spot-on perfect. Uh, and maybe bring out a little bit of the more exciting tones that are in like the center mid range from like 1.5 to 2.5, something like that. But, you know, it's honestly, if it went out like this, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. It already sounds pretty darn good. So yeah, that's, that's my tracking setup. I, I guess I could like leave the link to the template or whatever, but honest to God, like it's, it's a very, very simple template. I think that anybody could easily recreate this. And the, the point is, is that it, I'm not trying to create a new sound or do my engineering so much as get the sound that needs to happen right at the source. All right, guys, so to wrap this up, the basic idea is that we're not really trying to get our sound from the template. The sound comes from the artist. The main thing that we're trying to do with the template is just make the artist's job as easy and smooth as possible. Anyway, you know the deal. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you dig what I'm doing here on this channel, don't forget to hit subscribe with the bell notifications. And you know the mantra, we are musicians, sound is our instrument. Uh, Mr. Wise, excuse me. And this mic is my instrument, and I will need it to get started, buddy. So, let's get to work.